Thank you, Daryl, for inviting me here today, and thank you to the organizers generally. Um, I, I should say um, before, particularly if I'm going to have a title of, of a talk like this, it's really, really important that I read the part that falls below the title and be absolutely clear that the views I'm expressing today are my own and do not necessarily reflect the views of the Federal Reserve Bank of New York, the Federal Reserve System, the Basel Committee, any member of the Basel Committee, save for me, um, and anyone else who might have some vague affiliation with me. So, um, but thank you for, notwithstanding all that, thank you in particular for inviting me to talk today. Um, so with that um, level setting of expectations, uh, what I wanted to do, I appreciate the opportunity today to really try to give some perspective on what were at least one, if not several members of the Basel Committee thinking uh, as we went uh, as we uh, tried to implement a set of reforms to capital and liquidity. Um, I think it is helpful to do so. One, it will be a, a nice uh, setup for the panel discussion that follows. The other is to, uh, I, I think it will be great today to actually be sitting in the middle of a debate rather than on one side of debate. I find myself with most opportunities to speak. Um, there's a question of, of, the consistent question is, how could you possibly, you've done too much uh, clearly, we have to back off. I suspect comfortably today the conversation will be considerably more balanced than that. Um, so, uh, as and, and my, my remarks without planning uh, follow very neatly from David's. So, thank you, David. Um, so, there, there are some things in setup that I don't need to touch on. One is it's fair to say that uh, during the crisis, I, I would describe it as uncertainty dominated a question of. of, of understanding specific distress. As David said, the market was not differentiating what otherwise turned out to be the stronger or weaker firms in many cases. Um, and uh, what was troubling for many of us within the regulatory community is it was uh, painfully obvious that the regulatory framework, supervisory and regulatory framework, was contributing to this uncertainty. And I'd say it contributed to it in two ways. One, um, the I think we all understood there was always going to be a gap between the regulatory assessment or an accounting-based assessment of a firm's financial condition and the market assessment or the contemporary, you know, the sort of there was always going to be a lag. Um, I think the gap, uh, as we went through the crisis, the gap uh, began to grow even faster than any of us had anticipated. Um, so that was the first concern. I think the second concern is there was great appreciation that uh, some of the problems that were beginning to materialize were driven in part, although not exclusively, by incentives that were created by the regulatory framework. Um, this, and this extended to both capital, where as David noted, there was clearly insufficient capital um, and questions of incentive, as well as liquidity, where the absence of a consistent or harmonized international liquidity standard made both supervisory and regulatory assessments of liquidity um, it, even more uh, difficult to be the basis for, for market assessments. Um, as a response to this, the Basel Committee uh, developed a package of, and continues to develop, a package of regulatory reforms um, that some people have asked what was the principal objective or what was the theory that the committee was trying to solve. Um, what I can tell you is that a lot of committee members had a, a range of different experiences through the crisis, um, and the common theme to all was a deep concern about the transmission to the real economy of distress that, it, that originated in the financial sector and that in some sense this should not happen in this way and that we had to look back at the regulatory framework, uh, try to uh, implement a set of reforms that would make the financial sector and financial regulated financial institutions more, resilience to sh more resilient to shocks, particularly to get at this, this concern about the spillovers from distress in the financial sector into the real economy. Um, as you all know well, uh, in December of last year the committee agreed on a package that addresses many of the aspects of the reform, although as I'll note in a minute, uh, there's still work ongoing. Um, the, these reforms touched on the breadth of the regulatory framework, um, extending from efforts to increase the uh, capacity of banks to absorb losses on a going concern basis by looking at both the, at all of the, the definition of capital, how capital, how risk was measured, as well as what the standards would be applied um, to, for the first time on an interna international basis, complement this with a risk, less risk-based uh, leverage ratio. Um, also for the first time to introduce a set of consistent international liquidity standards. I say standards plural because the committee has proposed or has agreed upon uh, two standards. One to address the resilience to 
shock, you know, short-term shocks, very similar to what David described, um, and another that tries to address questions of structural funding mismatches. Um, it, underlying all of these, both in an explicit as well as implicit basis, is a perspective that is, um, is in a word or easily described as a macroprudential one, but uh, one of my colleagues uh, uh, consistently gives me grief for using words that I can't easily define. So let me try to be specific. Um, through the thinking about the calibration of the, st the design and calibration of the standards, um, e even in cases where there is no explicit either countercyclical nature of the standard or no explicit ca uh, effort to capture the social cost or the, the externalities, there was a view that we needed to try to reduce the pro-cyclicality of the standards to try to take account of the drivers of systemic risk, so particularly focusing on questions of interconnectedness. Um, and that should be a consistent perspective throughout the framework and not just in the things like a surcharge for systemic importance um, or a countercyclical capital requirement, which were themselves explicitly macroprudential. Um, the committee throughout its deduction, uh, discussions, excuse me, um, recognized uh, a difficult trade-off, and that is that uh, part of what would help, help uh, one of the contributors to uh, emerging from the crisis would give clarity on what the new regulatory landscape would look like. Um, the difficulty is to give clarity and not introduce a set of reforms that themselves exacerbate the current problems. Um, the committee tried to straddle this almost impossible line by introducing explicitly a long, you know, for many of us what we consider a very long sort of phase in and transition period. Um, I think I can look at a number of people in the room who would challenge me and say immediately yes, but uh, the market is effectively bringing those standards forward. Uh, I never figured out how to solve that problem at all. Um, the best we can do is be quite clear that um, there's value in, in providing transparency about what the reforms will look like, committing to them while the crisis is still quite fresh in our memories and maybe quite, in some cases, current, um, and then providing, at least on the regulatory side, a commitment not to bring forward those standards. Um, I don't have the capacity or the ability to influence uh, market expectations. Um, specifically, both the liquidity and leverage standards um, are also subject to a, an what's called an observation period. And this is the recognition that each are uh, new from an international perspective. And while it was important that we committed to a framework, uh, there's also the recognition that uh, there may be, continue to be unintended consequences from the introduction of those standards. And so the committee is working very closely with researchers, with the, in, the industry, to try to understand what, those unintended, what the consequences will be, um, balanced by the recognition that not all consequences are unintended. Um, so the answer of what is a standard that would produce no change uh, is not the one that we were looking for. Um, and finally, with this, in this perspective, the work continues on, I think, two important complementary areas. One is uh, very closely related to this, which is what are the prudential standards that will be applied to systemically important financial institutions, including how do we define systemically important financial institutions, and then what is the combination of expectations around capital, liquidity, uh, supervision. Um, and then the second is uh, a, another stream of work, which I'll only touch on briefly today, um, but I think is very important, and, and some of the questions actually touched on this uh, in David's session which is the just understanding broadly the, what should the expectations be for the capacity of both the private sector and the public sector to uh, allow firm, to, to enable firms to recover from deep financial distress um, and or be resolved if necessary. Um, so a, let me just touch on a few of the pieces that I discussed just now. Um, first, in terms of measuring capital adequacy, uh, the both the market taught regulators something very important, uh, as well as sort of some of our own efforts, supervisory efforts, for example, the uh, supervisory stress test or SCAP that was conducted, um, really reinforced a, what is now a fairly uh, well or simply agreed point, which is common equity matters a whole lot, and it may be the only thing that really matters. Um, I think it was an unfortunate development of the regulatory framework that somehow we uh, probably unintentionally incented uh, the, the creation of hybrid capital instruments. And if nothing else, I'll be really happy if we go back to a, a I don't mean simpler in terms of complexity, but a, a simpler assessment of the capital adequacy. 
Um, and so really there's a lot of efforts focused on both what capital is, what we consider capital for regulatory purposes, how we measure risk, and then what the, what, to what level we would hold firms. Um, really all designed to allow firms to absorb losses on a going concern basis. Again, recognizing that financial distress uh, from the large, particularly large internationally active institutions uh, creates real knock-on effects into the, into the real economy. Um, it was important that these efforts not just address the capital requirement, um, although most of the attention has been focused on that, but also, as I noted, address sort of what counts as capital, the definition of capital, what is deducted from capital. So really, this was a movement to a, a try to a simpler measure of a regulatory defined measure of tangible common equity. And then importantly, how we also measure risk. Um, many of the, um, and so some people also cite, that, and we'll come back to this in a moment, the increase in capital requirements. What I promise you is that the effective increase in capital requirements are larger than the stated increase in capital requirements because the measure of risk against risk-weighted assets is itself also being increased. Uh, that is twofold. One, it's to capture the risk of certain activities. It al also is an effort to address some of the relative risk measurement um, between activities which uh, were demonstrated, in some cases demonstrated before the crisis, to be riskier than, the, than they were captured. And so a lot of the changes were trying to address questions in trading, uh, for example, both the credit sensitive assets that banks hold in trading, as well as their counterparty exposures, um, and then also exposures to other financial institutions. I noted before, uh, comment, I made a comment earlier about the trying to have a sort of macro prudential perspective. This is one of the areas in the capture, measure or capture of risk that that is most particularly seen. Whereas in each of these, um, some in the first two explicitly, in the third implicitly, it was particularly looking at measuring risk, not just given the current conditions of markets, but really taking a view at what would stressful conditions look like. And the reason for doing this is it was a painful recognition that it was, um, it, it's not really a, a state, of, it's hard to imagine the state of world, the world where the institutions that we care about the most are in deep financial distress that is also not a period of increasing or high volatility in markets. I don't, I don't really want to get into which way the causation runs. I don't feel that I really need to decide which way it runs, just to recognize that calibra uh, calibrating capital requirements and capitalizing large, you know, internationally active firms to periods of market distress is, is the state of the world, is, is the correct state of the world for us. Um, in terms of calibrating capital requirements, uh, it is, uh, it may be surprising, and it's, um, if you had asked a bunch of regulators to define exactly what capital requirements are for um, prior to maybe the last year, uh, you would have gotten first a whole bunch of blank stares, second a variety of answers. Um, and so I think one of the real uh, good disciplines that, that came through uh, the capital requirements is both to clean up the definition of capital and then really try to get to the theory of what capital is. So in terms of the cleaning up, um, and, and it's also, I should say, add, uh, another point is to recognize that for these firms, consistent with my comment about a going concern, that we shouldn't be looking at a solvency standard or an insolvency standard, that it was important to consider both what, how much capital would these firms need to be viewed as viable in the market, and how much capital would allow these fir firms to stay viable even through a period of stress. And as you'll see in a moment, both of those perspectives were brought into the capital framework. Um, the second, through the introduction of a capital buffer, an amount of capital in excess of the minimum for which there is non-discretionary restrictions on capital distributions. And this is to get at both the idea, first you want banks to be able to maintain uh, their capital requirements even in a period of stress, and importantly, this is another area where the, that macro prudential perspective came in. One of the most destructive sort of pro-cyclical behaviors that many of us observe is you had even firms that were suffering financial distress wanted to signal to the market strength and continued to make capital distributions either in the form of share repurchases or maintaining dividends despite the fact that there is private knowledge, private information about the financial distress they're either un or under or face. Um, this allowed, this is a very destructive sort of cycle of allowing capital to flow out of distressed financial institutions and the financial system as a whole at a time when you would really like capital conservation to be occurring. And so the idea of having non-discretionary restrictions on capital distributions is to take away some of this signaling effect. Um, take, and that affects both the, and to be fair, that behavioral response 
Um, you might say, well, why didn't supervisors do this already? Um, and to, to my point is, to be fair, um, this is both a private sector problem and a public sector problem. It is very difficult to announce to the world that either for individual firms or as a group, you're going to require capital distributions when that same sort of fear that is you would signal, that, that signal might be taken as one of broad weakness, or either firm specific weakness or broad weakness, and actually exacerbate the problems. And so this is one of those cases where I think smartly we are seeking to tie our own hands. Um, to, just to get the factual part out of the way, uh, under Basel I and Basel II, the, there were definitions of tier one and total capital that were subject to requirements of 4% and 8% respectively. There was a expectation of that common equity be the predominant form of, of tier one capital, but there was no explicit common equity standard. Um, as you've seen under Basel III, there is now explicitly a common equity standard where there's a minimum of 4.5%. Um, there is this capital conservation, which at all times will be 2.5%. And if a firm were to fall beneath that, 25 on top of the 45 sorry. So it starts at 7%, which would require firms to progressively begin to, to, begin to restrict. Uh, it's not, I should say it's not binary. It would, it would lead to progressive restrictions on distributions of capital in relation to earnings. And then on top of that, um, there's a framework for an explicitly counter-cyclical buffer where um, supervisors or regulators have the capacity to increase capital requirements, increase the point at which this capital conservation would start um, based on an assessment where there was a period of uh, excess, excess growth in relation to GDP. Um, as I started to note before, the, unfortunately it was, it was surprising to many of us that we couldn't really defend a real simple definition of why we had capital requirements and exactly how to calibrate them. And so as part of the effort to revisit the calibration, the, the committee agreed upon um, a definition both for what the intent of the minimum was as well as what the intent of the capital conservation buffer. As you can see, the intent of the minimum is really to allow for an amount of capital such that if the firm were to operate at that level, it would still be viewed as viable in the market. Now, to state the obvious, this is not actually observable. And so one of the calibration challenges, and it's probably not going to be the same for all firms, it may also not be the same over time, um, but the effort is to try to, on an unconditional basis, come up with what we think is a reasonable proxy for that concept. Um, and then the capital conservation buffer, as I noted, is an amount of capital designed to allow firms to experience loss, absorb those losses in capital, and still be, continue to be viewed as viable in the market, continue to, to remain above their requirements. And as I note, they're very informative, and, but particularly for the minimum, it's not directly observable. Um, so the next couple of slides are actually drawn from, I, I should give uh, explicit credit to one of my colleagues, Beverly Hurdle, uh, at the Federal Reserve Bank in New York, who led a international effort to try to take these, con well, to develop these conceptual definitions and take them and pursue a calibration strategy, an empirical strategy, to inform the calibration of the Basel Committee. Um, and she's written on this both in the New York Fed as well as you can read uh, more of the international detail through the Basel Committee's website. Um, so briefly, the empirical strategy for the regulatory minimum is to, and, and this was also uh, credit to Andy Kriskis and Till Shorman having sort of uh, being among the ones who introduced this concept of looking at uh, the return on risk-weighted assets. And the idea would be to develop, use the historical data to develop a distribution of the return on, uh, on risk-weighted assets, really the negative return on risk-weighted assets, and then think about what's the appropriate sort of confidence interval once you have this distribution to, for firms to be considered viable. The idea being if a firm, you could say, for example, there is a less than 1% chance over the next 99, uh, sorry, over the next year that this firm would be insolvent. Um, that's the conceptual translation. Um, and the analysis tried to gather data across different jurisdictions, across different time periods, looked at a range of potential percentiles, a range of different uh, time distributions, um, and the net of which was to develop uh, illustrations like the one you see here, which is to really understand what that distribution of return on neg negative return on risk-weighted assets is. So this graph is actually across across seven countries, and yes, there are 11 bars because um, we had they had data from multiple jurisdictions in some cases, or multiple data sources from jurisdictions in some cases, and it looks at what was the 99th percentile of the distribution of the negative return on risk-weighted assets over a one-year period, and we did this not just for the for the 99th percentile, but other distribution, other percentiles, uh, as well as um, other time periods. The challenge to all of this is you're not going to be surprised. Um, 
what, what you are to conclude from this is very much in the eye of the beholder. Let me come back to that in a moment. Um, the empirical strategy on the capital conservation buffer is a little more straightforward, although it again requires a, a little bit of a leap of, faith, leap of faith, which is to look at periods of you know, systemic crises and look at periods, what were the cumulative losses across institutions. Now, you, you might say, why couldn't you do the negative return on risk-weighted asset analysis here too? Um, and to be fair, we did. Um, but conceptually, it's important to think that there's another way of motivating this, which is to look at a period of crisis. What was the experience that banks ex uh, had through that crisis and, and look through that? I mean, we did, they gathered data from both the US and abroad, um, to comp and, and specifically of the most recent crisis, but also gathered data from earlier periods in, that may not have had the broad, you know, sort of global perspective. Um, we also looked at cases where instead of the actual loss experienced or, during a crisis, looked at cases of what would have been the projected or, theor or, or theoretical loss in, period, in a period of crisis. And so as one example, we used at the US stress test results, the SCAP, as another, thankfully, a period of loss that was not realized, but is also a basis for trying to measure what those losses will be. Um, again, to give you an idea, um, I, I should take a slight digression. One of the challenge, these are two graphs of the distribution of pre-tax and after-tax net income. Um, one of the challenges we experienced uh, both in the context of the stress test uh, as well as in the capital calibration is um, I'm really glad I'm an not an accountant because translating like fun things like economics into real things like capital ratios um, turns out to be a, a more than a little challenging and you have to ask the question, okay, it's, it's, all, it's easy for all of us to say, oh, we'll just look at after tax net income and we'll proxy that for the hit to capital. But um, having um, been hadn't tried to, pro to actually project individual firms' capital ratios, you get the fun of taking their pre-tax net income, running that through the capital calculations, looking at a variety of other factors, and the end of that is you do a lot of guessing when it's all done. So what did we take from this? As I said, it requires a, uh, a fair bit of judgment, and there are, you will not be surprised, different views about how to look at the same empirical analysis. Broadly speaking, the results across the negative, the return on risk-weighted assets suggested that the minimum standard should be on a Basel I basis across jurisdictions, sort of somewhere in the four to six percent of risk-weighted assets. Um, that would cover losses that would have, if you believe the empirical, the theoretical definition, that would have covered losses out to a very high percentile um, over a variety of time frames. Uh, the, capital the capital conservation results uh, a much, uh, again, a rich set of, of information, um, produce results that you, know, you could reasonably conclude would be anywhere from three to 7% of Basel I risk-weighted assets. In some cases, Basel II risk-weighted assets. Um, you'll note I conspicuously said Basel I and Basel II in that case, um, because one of the challenges is if you, well, the, the first best solution would be to take the measurement of risk that you'll have prospectively, Basel III, and run that back through history so you could actually look at the return on Basel III risk-weighted assets. Um, none of us have the, the data that are sufficient to do that. And so you have to proxy for what under Basel III would expectations of 4 to 6% or 3 to 7% translate into in a Basel III framework. Um, and the idea, the reason, to, the basis for this is, as I noted, if Basel III risk weights are increasing, uh, if the risk-weighted assets under Basel III are increasing, then if you just went for the Basel I standard, you would be increasing capital by more than you otherwise would have intended. Um, that's balanced by the recognition that exactly what the Basel III capital requirement risk weights will be, um, you can only sort of proxy that by looking at the static behavior of firms, and you have to sort of make the judgmental assessment of how will their behavior change in response to the introduction of the new standards and what would then the return on, the, the theoretical return on Basel III risk-weighted assets look like. Um, if you're getting the sense that you know, all this requires a lot of judgment, uh, you're right. There is not a neat and clean science to how do you calibrate capital requirements. Um, the co committee's collective judgment is that if the view as the minimum which should have been under four to six percent under Basel I, that got translated into a minimum of four and a half percent. Don't ask me how we got to a half a percent. I will. To this day, having been in the room the entire time, I still can't tell you how we got to four and a half. Um, and similarly on the buffer, that it was then divided in some sense between the, uh, the capital conservation buffer of two and a half percent and this counter cyclical buffer, which itself could also be up to two and a half percent. The calibration was supported by efforts from the quantitative impact study where 
Many of the bankers in this room spent quite a few hours trying to proxy what the capital requirements would be under Basel III, uh, as well as analysis that was conducted by economists working with the Basel Committee to understand both what would be the cost to the real economy of transitioning between two different sort of capital regimes, as well as what the long run costs and benefits were of being in a higher capital regime, where the long run benefit is the reduced risk of a crisis and reduced cost of the cri and mitigating the cost of the financial crisis uh, against the cost, um, which we can debate later, of imposing higher capital standards in all periods. Let me actually change gears just for a few minutes, and I, I want to make sure I leave time for questions. Um, and speak briefly about measuring liquidity. Um, as I noted, there was no uh, internationally agreed liquidity standard. Um, there were in some jurisdictions where a variety of liquidity standards, and as David noted in, in his comments, um, one of the clear commitments from the committee was to address this sort of inconsistency of the assessment of liquidity. And also, in doing so, think about the, the resilience or the lack of resilience that were associated with illiquidity. And so the committee eventually uh, pursued sort of two strategies. One was to enhance the resilience of the financial sector to short-term shocks. Um, and this is a framework called the liquidity coverage ratio, which uh, looks an awful lot like, as David said, he may not disagree with all, he may not agree with all the calibration, but in design it looks very similar to how um, Goldman Sachs would assess its near-term liquidity risk to size the, the pool of unencumbered liquid assets. And then a net stable funding ratio, which has its history um, as some people will recognize in something like a cash capital model, which is essentially to look at the uh, sort of look at the structural funding of firms and say if you have uh, either illiquid assets, and particularly if you have to the degree you have illiquid assets, you want those funded by, as David noted, also uh, either stable or long-term funding. Um, we can, and I suspect others will take a point, and David start just down this path. Um, we can agree conceptually on the framework for assessing liquidity. Um, but going from a framework, a conceptual framework, to an actual regulatory standard, uh, again, involves a fair degree of judgment, um, and one that is particularly challenged when you start with the simple observation uh, that uh, if you have a view about you want firms to, to some degree, self-insure ex ante for systemic liquidity risk or, or, or sort of uh, broad distress in financial markets, you get into a discussion of how bad could such a crisis be, and to what degree do you want firms on an ex-ante basis to self-insure? Um, I conspicuously can try to say ex-ante self-insure, um, because the introduction of these liquidity standards is not meant to uh, be um, informative or directive about what supervisors, or more importantly, central banks would do in response to a liquidity crisis, but tries to recognize that um, unless you are ready to pre-commit to a liquidity response, you want firms on an ex-ante basis to self-insure for certain types of shocks. Um, the challenge is defining what those shocks are, to what degree do you want firms to self-insure, and even in measuring those shocks. Um, one of the, some people have cited the historical experience of the recent crisis as, well, do you want firms to insure, self-insure all of that? Um, and some of us, not quite in a rhetorical response would, be, response would be, I would like to understand how deep the shocks would be in the absence of official sector intervention um, if you look at the breadth of, of programs that the Federal Reserve and others provided, um, it's hard to argue that we've seen what the worst liquidity crisis, thankfully, it's hard to argue what we've, we have not seen the worst liquidity crisis. So again, you get back into a very much a judgmental assessment of what's the, how to measure the risk um, and uh, to what degree do you want firms to self-insure self for that. Um, and so the framework is a fairly straightforward one. Uh, it, compare, it tries to size a pool of high-quality unencumbered assets against what is broadly, a, a admittedly very severe, principally wholesale sh shock to wholesale funding that also captures a, a loss of retail funding as well. Um, as I noted, calibrating the runoff rates, we, we did everything we could. Um, here there are less, even more so than in the capital case, there are, is a less of a rich data set to, pull, to draw upon because we don't have the history of capital standards. And so the committee looked across the breadth of what was the historical experience, um, how have banks internally calibrated their own standards, uh, their own risk measures, how have other supervisors designed standards, um, all of which then, as I note, is, a, is sort of put into a blender of, of a judgmental assessment of what is the right combination. Um, but importantly, layered onto that is, as I noted earlier, is a view about wanting to uh, 
be particularly mindful of cases of, system, of the drivers of systemic risk, particularly in this case, uh, on the one hand, uh, sort of thinking about the interconnectedness of financial institutions, and, on top, and also on, in the same vein, thinking about one of the forms of externality, and David noted this as well, is the potential uh, externality associated with the distressed or fire sale of assets to meet liquidity needs. And so that's why if people, and you can see that very much, for example, in how both claims on or sort of assets and liabilities of financial institutions are treated in the, in the framework. Um, I will be the first to say there are a lot of questions about what the effects of the liquidity standards will be. We are actively engaged in trying to understand those better. Um, I gave you here the numbers that there were, came out of the last quantitative impact study. Uh, the committee is already engaged in another quantitative impact study, um, but I should also, it would not be fair to look at those averages and say we've gotten it about right um, since there's a wide disparity of, of results sitting underneath those averages. Um, and there, as I note, there are material differences across institutions, across business models, across jurisdictions. And part of our efforts, and, and uh, I'm sure others will note this today, is to really understand what the consequences of the standards will be and try to strike the right balance between the objectives of promoting resilience and not having these unintended consequences. Um, let me conclude uh, by just saying, um, as you all know, Basel is a inter not binding international agreement. I'm on our good days, it's a, it's a good signpost. Um, and so I, I, while I, I completely agree with David's answer that consistency of implementation is one of the critical things um, that has to be achieved despite the fact that uh, each jurisdiction is in the process of implementing the Basel agreements. Um, and there will be continued discussion about how consistently that is done both through regulation as well as the supervision or oversight of that. Um, at the same time, uh, the committee and the Financial Stability Board continue to have discussions, as I noted earlier, about what is the pro appropriate regulatory and supervisory framework for systemically important firms. Um, as you probably know, the, probably the, the, the key uh, component of that is considering if there should be or what the form of it will be of a systemic uh, a capital surcharge for systemically important firms. Um, the key attribute here is that uh, although much of the calibration was dominated by data from large internationally active institutions, that really was consistent with the theoretical definitions that we described, addressed at what the solvency of those in institutions individually. The effort through the systemic surcharge is very much to get at a, a conceptual framework that starts with, like pollution, a view of externalities, what those externalities are, and then it was, it was consistent with a, one of the questions that was uh, underlying a piece of the question that David answered, which is to what degree should firms be required to internalize the social cost of their actions, these externalities? And again, there will be judgment about to what degree that should occur. Um, a, um, in the United States, as you all know, Dodd-Frank is mandating higher prudential standards, which include higher capital standards um, for a, a broad swath of systemically important firms going down all the way to those that have $50 billion or more in consolidated assets. And finally, um, I don't want to, I will not get into this in depth, but um, as I noted at the beginning, a, a key complement to the discussions of the prudential framework, capital and liquidity framework, is this question of how do we address the sort of both the resolvability, but more to my taste, even more importantly, the capacity for firms to have a private sector recovery from deep financial distress. Um, and this is an area where I think many of us were again uh, surprised and not in a good way at the limit, the sort of the, the limited options that were available to both firms and supervisors to respond to deep financial distress. And I think there's a, a shared understanding both within the, the public and private sectors that the time to, to create optionality is not when you're in the middle of a crisis, but to address the sort of business practices ex ante that would create that optionality where hopefully, if, and hopefully we won't, we were to get into financial distress. So again, thank you, Daryl, for the opportunity to provide my perspectives. And with uh, at least 10 minutes, uh, I'd be happy to take questions. Hi, Evan Pico from City. Hi, Evan. Mark, one of the most uh, unusual features of the liquidity proposal in contrast to the capital requirements under Basel II and III is that firms are not allowed any input of history. 
up for capital, we rely on our own assessments of probability of default, loss given default, market volatility, et cetera. For the liquidity proposal, all of the assumptions of drawdowns of liability or increases of contingent assets are stipulated. So let me begin on the asset side. Uh, one of the most uh, bothersome features is the assumption that contingent credit, wholesale credit, would be drawn down 100%. All unused commitments are assumed to be drawn down 100%. No, it's actually not technically correct, but keep going, sorry. But no bank has ever experienced that. Why would you have made, why would the uh, Basel Committee have made such a severe assumption for both the liquidity ratio and the leverage ratio? So the, just to be, sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you, uh, Evan, but to be clear, the, the only place that credit commitments are assumed to be 100% drawn are credit commitments are provided to other financial institutions. And so this is one where I am comfortable saying that there are uh, prudential overlays that are imposed that do not match the historical experience, but do in fact match um, what my understanding of most banks' internal risk assessments are, at least on the availability of such lines, is that they don't assume that they are available. That's on the, in, the inflow side. But to, to your point, I think there's generally, uh, let me go back to where you started, is that there is generally a question of when you think about liquidity about how to take account of a firm's individual historical experience. Happily, most of the firms that will be subject to the liquidity requirements did not experience a liquidity crisis of the nature that we are trying to, to consider here. Um, it is admittedly a um, sort of a, a conditional assessment. Conditional on being viewed in the market as questionable, what would be the, draw, what would be the potential outflows? Um, that is a, again, I, all I can say is happily most firms don't have, have that experience. Now, helpfully, there are a number of firms in this room who have acquired failed institutions who are providing incremental data that is trying to inform the discussions. Um, but there is a real balance between to what degree you can inform the analysis by your own, a firm's own historical experience, and to what degree do we want to inform the standards by the historical experience of those that were effectively subject to the shock that we're trying to describe. And that's why, I mean, I think the committee was, uh, I would say, and then the other piece of that is that there was a real commitment in, in the liquidity standards to have something that looks a lot more like sort of Basel I for capital, that is, there's a common regulatory framework that is not uh, part of banks' internal assessments. Um, we, as you and others know, um, we will be very active in continuing to seek people's views on how to revisit those standards as we go through the observation period. Thanks. Hi, my name is Mimi Mangus from Union Bank here in San Francisco. I have a couple of questions. Um, the first one is, you mentioned the observation period. Um, we have recently got our own uh, QIS template and we're filling it out. Um, my, the question is, if we don't have the data, and I think many banks are in the same situation, you don't have the data to actually calculate the LCR ratio or the NSFR, how can you give reliable data that's meaningful for you to analyze? And it, it, it begs the question, do we have to invest in systems now to calculate that data so you can, so you, it, so you can then make your determination? It's just a practical question, how are you going to do that? And then I have another one. So just to the practical, um, I, I think the answer is that the, particularly in the LCR, the framework mirrors in its design uh, what many firms do internally. Now, there's, there, I have no, I, I fully expect that the specific definitions do not match what firms do internally. And this has been the a constraint of all impact studies, is you're always trying to strike the right balance between wanting the most accurate information as possible, balanced by asking for a commitment to modify your systems before you know, well, one, for the time to modify the systems, and two, to modify them in a way before everything is sort of set in stone. Um, that's why I find myself using the phrase best efforts a lot. I think just to answer a part of the question you didn't ask, the even greater challenge we have in the observation period is I noted the idea of unintended consequences. Um, the real challenge That's we face. Next question. Oh, okay. Well, let me ask you. Well, I'll stop and I'll let you ask the next question, then I'll give you the same answer. Sorry. Okay, sure. Um, regional bank. And um, you, you're probably aware that uh, regional banks have more difficulty in, in meeting the LCR than a bank like Goldman. I, I, I've heard rumors that Goldman's LCR is 100%. Um, this is largely because regional traditional lending banks rely on the federal home loan bank system. 
and we hold large portfolios of GSEs, MBS, and debentures. Um, I understand that in Australia, because they don't have enough sovereign paper for all the banks to meet the LCR, they're developing a federal home loan bank type system. And I think there's also some discussion possibly of, uh, on GSE reform, but ultimately to replace Fannie and Freddie, perhaps the federal home loan bank type system, privately owned by member banks is the way to go. Now I understand that the whole intention here was to have a level playing field between, across countries, but U.S. banks have benefited from the federal, federal home loan bank system and their portfolios of GSEs. So perhaps we have benefits that should be counted. That's my next question. I was kind of wondering where the question was, but um, no, I, I sorry. I, um, the, right, th there is a real question. I mean, one of the challenges of the home loan bank system from a, capturing it in a regulatory framework is, uh, it is, I don't want to say it's unique to the United States, but it's almost unique to the United States. It is a, and I, I'm not an expert on the home loan bank system, so apologies if I don't get all of this technically correct. It is a, not explicitly a government source of government, but it is also not entirely viewed as a, as a privately owned uh, framework. Um, it creates some interesting tension. Um, and then I think the challenge, even taking a step back, the, the challenge for the framework from a liquidity perspective is the desire to have firms, that this, this self, in terms of the self-insurance, is that the self-insurance is of the form, it's collateral that is uh, liquid both in private markets and liquid through the central bank. And there's a question about uh, if you don't have access to the home loan banks, and the, from what I understand, access to the home loan banks is not guaranteed, uh, then how would you go about monetizing some of the collateral that is available? Now, I, I will be the first to say we continue to try to understand the interaction between the home loan banks, liquidity risk management, and what is the right way to capture it in the framework. There's a broader question which you didn't ask, which is, uh, what, to what degree will the liquidity standards in Basel, how far down through the U.S. system, financial system, will that be pushed? Um, as you all know, the Basel II is only mandatory in the United States for banks that have uh, at least two. You know, Basel was de designed broadly and it is intended for large internationally active uh, financial institutions. In the United States, for the purpose of Basel II, it's only mandatory for banks that have consolidated assets of $250 billion or more or $10 billion of foreign assets. There is a really good question about uh, to what, what is the scope of the application uh, for liquidity standards. It is complicated by, uh, in Dodd-Frank, the, the 165 enhanced prudential standards are applied to all banks with over $50 billion in assets, and that includes a call for enhanced liquidity standards. Um, there's some peculiar irony of saying they need to have enhanced standards when we don't have a standard to begin with. But, um, it, so that, that is still part of, that will very much be an active part of the U.S. consultation. And just to, to preempt a different question, um, there will be a notice of proposed rulemaking in the United States. My belief is it will be later, it will be later this year. Um, and that will open up for a good discussion, good uh, active discussion uh, around uh, implementation of the, both the capital and liquidity reforms in the United States. Sorry. Uh, Mark, hi. Chris. Hi, Kinsey. How are you? Can I just say, David, how come you got all the academic questions? Which I might, I'm not sure I want this. I may come out better in this trade, but I think there's something funny about you getting all the academic and I get all the industry questions. Funny, but not surprising. <laughs> I, I can't, so I, I okay. Sorry, so, please. Uh, so Mark, you mentioned earlier looking at uh, impacts in products and markets. What are the types of things that, just from a a priori standpoint, you're most concerned about? So, um, that to, to suggest that I could narrow it down, I won't. Um, so, uh, I think that the let me let me give you rather than what I'm worried about. Let me sort of describe what I think is the challenge, and this is something I started to say before. Um, you would like, in principle, if, if the world were a nice, good academic experiment, you would like to introduce the standards, see how market participants respond, see what happens to the cost and availability of credit, and then go back and say, well, now we want to change the standards because we don't like the outcome in some sense. Um, real world intrudes. Probably not the right thing to do is introduce the standards, wait for the unintended things to happen, and then respond. And so the challenge we face right now is, and there's an active discussion with the many of the financial institutions in this room, to try to anticipate what their behavioral responses will be, how will business practices change, and then to make an assessment of how will those changes 
be translated into cost and availability of credit, uh, liquidity in different markets, cost of contingent liquidity in different markets, and then ask from a, both a, a sector specific as well as a broader, mac uh, broader macroeconomy question, are those results ones that we are comfortable with given the benefit of the enhanced uh, resilience of the financial system against the near-term cost? Um, an analogy I've used is I, I have um, so much more sympathy for the people who work on climate change than I ever did before. Um, I, I, um, I don't think I ever fully appreciated until recently the joy of, of having discussions which are all about immediate costs against uncertain future benefits. Um, and that, that is a particularly challenging analysis, so my, my sympathy goes out to people who work on climate change. My, my support for them, too, but my sympathy on top of that. Uh, last question. Sorry. Please. Hey, Mark. Bruce Cahan. Um, so uh, we've seen recently about 10 states propose either studying or creating state-owned banks. California has such a proposal. Federal Reserve Bank of Boston briefed last week on the impact of their proposal in Massachusetts. Um, and, and for a time, we, we watched um, a couple of financial institutions de facto be uh, publicly owned. Okay, So when you're looking globally and you're seeing state-owned or, or sovereign banks in unison in the same sort of banking space with the private sector, how does Basel sort of weigh their dimension of this ownership issue as to the cost of capital, as the cost of creating a money supply that is either less or more and more rigid under one form of ownership versus another? Um, that I, I can say a very practical point on that, which is um, we've looked at, for example, the um, what the liquidity standards would look like in different jurisdictions, and you get to some of the, the newer Basel members where the financial institutions are all state-owned, and the answers look very different, and you're, you're, you're trying to strike the right balance between, it doesn't get to your point about the competitive question, but you're trying to strike the right balance of what is the, you know, how, how do you think about the right scope of application when, if your stated objective is to limit the need for taxpayer or official sector support if you start with an institution that is in fact taxpayer owned. Um, I'm not clever enough to figure out what the right answer is other than to say um, those are the data points I tend to discount. Um, I'm not sure how to address the competitive question of when you have firms whose cost of capital is not reflective of a market cost of capital um, because of, of an explicit, in this case, uh, government guarantee um, I think we've seen there can be, you know, to, not to push it too far, we've seen there can be real distortions when you have firms that have what otherwise appear as private incentives or private objectives um, where they have a uh, not market-based cost of capital and that doesn't seem to lead to some of the best outcomes. Um, so, and, and yes, I am talking about GSEs. <laughs> so, anyway, Daryl, thank you very much. Thank you.